So some of you have been on this journey with me as far as learning how this word of knowledge thing works. And so I've been saying some odd things, but the Lord's been confirming them. Okay, so this morning I had a really weird one. I'm having to learn how to read these things because they're symbols often, and I don't know what the symbols mean until the Lord kind of shows me. So this morning I was praying with a couple of the people in the worship team, and I saw a person, I didn't know if it was male or female, holding a guitar. I thought, well, a lot of people play the guitar. I don't know what to do with that. Then I noticed, I was telling Melanie, I said, you know, I saw, saw somebody holding a guitar, and they go, oh, they were holding it the wrong way. So they're a left-handed guitar player, right? So I go, okay. And she goes, Matt's a left-handed guitar player. I go, oh, you're right. He is, isn't he? So we come in here this morning, and I said, okay, so a left-handed guitar player. I'm looking for anybody other than Matt because I don't know that it's Matt. Maybe somebody else. I want to make sure there's not a couple of them. Well, there was only Matt. He was the only left-handed guitar player. So I said, Matt. And he's sitting back there. He looks fine. I go, do you have something ailing you right now? And he goes, he goes, yeah, I do. But Matt got a little cocky in a good way. He goes, tell me what it is. <laughs> you tell me what it is. And so I, I saw this. Now I'm learning to read. I saw this picture. And it was from a commercial that was for an, and it showed this diagram of a, a body, you know, and it shows these bubbles coming up and this stuff coming out. And, and it's, it was a commercial for an acid reflux drug. So I said, Matt, do you have acid reflux? He goes, Yes, that's what I have the last three days. So, so God's working, God's moving, and we pray for him. But the reason I'm bringing that up is I want you to raise your level of faith a little that God wants to heal, okay? So I, I had another one right before this service. Now, hopefully it's one of you people. Sometimes I find it's somebody else during the day, but I hope it's in here. Um, so what I saw was a picture of a heart. It's a heart condition, but it, the heart looked a little bit big to me, so I'm thinking maybe an enlarged heart. Does anybody in here have a heart condition? Diagnosed with a, yeah, you have an enlarged heart? Okay, all right. Anybody else with a heart condition? All right, Donna, come on up, we'll pray for you. Okay, all right, all right. Well, Donna, just recently, we had one for uh, a word of for a lady with, or actually, I didn't know it was a lady, but a person with a pain from here to here, and that was you, wasn't it? And you got healed that night. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay, so turn around, Don. So the point of this is is this is this this isn't this isn't you know this isn't my show. This is Jesus' show, and Jesus wants to show you all that He's healing today. He's present today. He wants to raise up your level of faith that you believe God can do anything. All right. So we're going to pray for Donna. Have faith now. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know you wouldn't show us this unless you wanted to heal it, and you're the healer, Lord. And you said healing is the children's bread, and you wouldn't deny any of your children their bread. So right now, we call upon that, Lord. We say, uh, feed Donna that children's bread of healing right now for her heart. And we say to that heart condition, in the name of Jesus, heart, arteries, uh, uh, muscles in the heart, chambers of the heart, be made whole right now in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Fat deposit, you go right now in Jesus' name. Go in the name of Jesus. Dissolve, dissipate, be gone in the name of Jesus right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know, let your healing power just flow into you, Donna, right now. We just, oh, yeah, I felt something there. We release the healing power of Jesus into Donna's heart right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you feel something, Donna? Oh, I am so hot. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It's like a furnace. Amen. Yeah. So, so don't quote that out of context. Don't go to tell people Donna is so hot. <laughs> like a furnace. And, you know, that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting phenomenon, too, because I, I didn't feel any heat at all, but she did. And my wife, my wife the other night, she had uh, some issue on one side of her body, and I prayed for her with both hands. And just on the side that the issue was on, she said, my hand was burning her up. <laughs> but I couldn't feel a thing. I couldn't feel a thing. So God's moving, and God's healing, okay? And uh, you can, you're burning up, okay? Take the scarf off. It'll help. All right, so we're on moving forward. We're on moving forward, part seven right now. Taking possession of the promise, okay? Now, 
we've been following the journey of the children of Israel out of Egypt, which is the land of slavery, into the desert, which is a land of freedom, but a land of lack. And now we've come to the edge of the promised land with them. And it's finally time to go in and possess the land, right? We're not looking at these things in the Old Testament so that we can learn the history of Israel, though it's interesting. We're looking at these things because they directly correlate to the spiritual life of every believer. Okay? John, it's still too hot. We, too, at one point in time, we were delivered from the slavery of sin, like they were delivered from slavery in Egypt. We, too, were brought out of that place because we were brought, it says we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, kingdom of his dear son. So we were taken out of the place we were at, the land of slavery, kingdom of darkness, and we were brought into another place. Isn't that right? Okay. But what happens is when you get saved, here's what really happens. You get saved, you get released from slavery, just like they did. You, 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 you get set free. You're no longer under the devil, the evil slave master's domination. You're now free. But you will find yourself in a desert place, often, which is this. A place where, okay, I'm saved, but I still have some needs. I still have some lacks. I'm not sure what to do. A place that will teach you dependency upon God. That's the point, Okay. And you have to learn this dependency on God because once you learn the dependency on God, you realize that everything I have is from Him. All the strength I have is from Him. All the power I have is from Him. I depend completely on Him because that's what they had to do. When you realize that your focus is correct, then you will be filled with the Spirit of God to the point that the flesh will not have so much rule over you. The Spirit will have rule over you. And you will be able to go and do great things which in this case is possess the promised land. A lot of the promises don't come to us right off the bat because we have to learn some dependency on God. We have to learn who our source is, okay? Sometimes we think, I'm saved, i got all the power in the world. And you realize that you don't have all the power in the world. Jesus does, but you have to use his power. You have to tap into that power, okay? So we too have come into... uh, a place that sometimes is the land of lacking, but God wants us to understand that he has everything we need. Okay? We, too, have been given great promises, and it's up to us to get up, go after them, and possess them. Last week, we learned that Joshua and Caleb were different than any of the other men in their generation. In fact, out of all the 600,000 men of their generation, they were the only two men they were able to enter into the promised land. Isn't that right? We were looking at what was different about those two guys. What was the source of their amazing faith? And what we found is the source of their amazing faith came from one simple factor that is the most important thing you will ever learn about your walk with God. Personal relationship. Personal relationship. When you have religion without personal relationship, you just have ceremony. You just have works. You have something that has no connection to the power of God. You can go through all of the, you know, all of the the motions. You can take the communion even, right? You can say the prayers. You can do all that stuff that religious people do. But if you don't have a relationship, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It has no power. Now, let's look at the Lord's perspective of Israel's journey to the promised land in Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 12. Let's turn there. All right, so here's what it says. Remember the days of old, consider the generations long past. This is long past the uh, time that they went into the promised land. Ask your father and he'll tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. When he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. This is talking about the promised land. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his, his allotted inheritance. Now listen to this. We know about this because we've been reading about it. In a desert land, he found him, or you could say them, the children of Israel. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded them and cared for them. He guarded them as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young and then spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft, the Lord alone led them. No foreign god was with them. Okay? Now look a little closer at verses 10 through 12. It says, 
The Lord found Israel in a barren, howling waste or a wasteland. This was an impossible situation for survival. You take a couple million people out into a desert where there's barely enough food for a dozen men, and there's barely enough water for a couple of men, and you take a couple million out into a desert where there's no provision, and you expect to survive. It's a suicide mission. There's no way you're going to survive except if a miracle occurs, if God does something. If God doesn't do something, you're dead. Okay? In that desert, it goes on to say that he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. How did he shield them in the desert? Well, you see, in the desert, not only do you not have food and you don't have enough water, but you're in the blazing sun and you're going to bake to death on the desert sands unless you have some covering, some protection. Well, what God provided for them is by his spirit, he manifested as a pillar of cloud by day. And that pillar of cloud created a great shadow. And they followed in the shadow of that cloud and they were protected from the hot sun of the desert all day long. And you know, it's hot in the desert during the daytime, but I want you to know something. If you've never been to a desert, it's freezing cold in a desert in the nighttime. Not only was the sun too much for them to bear, but the cold was too much for them to bear also. But during the nighttime, if you stayed close to his presence, he was a pillar of fire. He's a pillar of fire. He shielded them in the desert by the pillar of cloud. He protected them and warmed them in the night by the pillar of fire. He provided for them in a place where there was no provision. He provided them with water that came from a rock that followed them. Okay? He provided them with food that fell from heaven. Wow. You know what they learned through all that? They learned without God, we're dead. They learned dependency on God. Some people think, well, at least they were kind of obedient in the wilderness because they were following the, the, you know, manifestation of the Lord's Spirit. If you didn't follow that cloud, you were dead. There's motivation right there. Even if your heart's not in it, you say, I think I'm going to stay in the shadow. I'm going to stay in the shadow. But what the Lord was teaching those people by taking them through the desert land, he was teaching them to have dependency on him. He was breaking off from them a dependency on foreign gods. Okay? He shielded them from the sun in the day. He warmed them by night. Now, this 11th verse says this. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. You know, this is quite an amazing thing that eagles do. Okay? It seems like a feat that only a superhero could do. But what eagles often do is when their young get big enough to where they should be flying, their young are like us. They don't want to leave the nest. They're fine. You know, it's like, jump out of this thing. Are you crazy? I've got a perfectly comfortable nest. And you bring me food, so awesome. I don't need to do anything. I'll just kick back and let you feed me. And the mother says, I've had it with you kids. You're leaving the house now. I'm kicking you out literally. And what the mother eagle does is makes the nest uncomfortable. And then she starts to budge them over the edge. And they're falling to their death. (laughs) And they begin to go like this. And she is there, though. She swoops down and catches them on her back. That's amazing. But she does. That's amazing. She catches them in midair and says, okay, let's take you back to the nest. We'll try that again. Now, when I was a kid, that's the way they taught kids to swim. Just throw them in the water, and hopefully they figure it out. And you come to the surface. And they didn't have somebody in the water catching you either. Okay? But so the Lord was trying to break them of their dependence on other things and trying to teach them to trust in him they could do great and mighty things, okay? So, an eagle. I want to teach them to be like the eagle. An interesting thing about, interesting thing about an eagle, I was watching an eagle one time. I, was, I decided I'm going to not even move till this eagle goes away because it was so fascinating to watch this eagle soaring on some wind currents. And this was down in Rainier Valley, so I'm not talking about up in the woods somewhere. And this eagle was circling and flying. And then after 15 minutes, I noticed this eagle never flapped its wings one time. And there were these crows flying up around it, and they were flapping as hard as they could to get up and try to get him out of their area. Never flapped his wings once. What does that tell me? That says this. He is soaring upon the wind. The wind, if there's no physical effort of his own, there is no work of his own, he's flowing in the spirit. You see, the wind in the Old Testament, that word wind is often 
uh, comes from the same root word as the word spirit. And we need to learn how to get out of the nest of our comfort zone and step out in faith on nothingness and float on the current of God's spirit. We need, to be learned, we need to learn to be led by the Spirit. We need to learn to soar in the Spirit. And when you soar in the Spirit, it's not effort because it's just God. You don't have to work it up. You just float. You just, you just go with the flow. And that's what God wants from us. Now, the 12th verse says, The Lord alone led, led them. No foreign God was with him. You see, they had lots of foreign gods back in Egypt. He wanted to break them of that addiction. So I'm going to put you in a place where you don't have your idol with you. Guess what? You don't have it. We destroyed all those. You don't have an idol. Often these people would carry idols with them. If they didn't carry an idol with them, then they had the big idol that was at the temples in Egypt that you could go and bow down and pray. Well, you know what? All their idols were stripped from them. The Lord made sure when they got out in the wilderness, they were stripped of all that stuff they depended on before so they could learn to just depend on him alone. That's what this says. It says the Lord alone led them. No foreign God was with them. They learned this, your gods will do you no good back in Egypt, but the God, the living God, the God of Israel, he is a God who could sustain you no matter what. That's what God does to us when we get saved. After you get saved, he wants you to learn in your early stages complete dependency upon him. He wants you to see that all the tricks that you used to use that would work for you don't work anymore. All the ways you got out of fixes before don't work anymore. So that you could turn all of your dependency upon him. So just before we go into the promised land, I want to bring something to your attention. Here's a question for you. Christianity, what's it all about? Is it all about the promise of heaven? The children of Israel in the promised land, what's that all about? What's that story about? Is it about a promised land that was given to Abraham's descendants? Sometimes we miss the point. To everything God is trying to show us. Christianity is not about heaven. It's about relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's what it's all about. Heaven is a fringe benefit of having a relationship with the Heavenly Father, but it's all about the relationship. That's all of it. That's everything. Everything God has done is because He loves us. It's about relationship. Everything He does for us, every bit of the Word of God, leads us into closer relationship with the Father. That's the whole purpose to all of it. For the children of Israel, it wasn't about the promised land. It was about relationship as well with their Heavenly Father. You'll find that whenever they broke off the relationship with the Heavenly Father, they lost the land. It's not about the land. It's about the relationship. The land was just a fringe benefit. The story of the prodigal son. He lost his fortune. He squandered it in in, in foreign lands. It wasn't about the fortune. It was about the relationship being restored to the Father. That's what the story is all about. It's about relationship with the Father. Jesus coming to earth and taking on the form of a man, dying on a cross. Is it all about the spiritual power that we've been given? Is it all about the freedom from sin? Is it all about the forgiveness of the enormous debt of sin? Those things are true, but is that what it's all about? Is it about uh, exercising authority over devils or having a mansion in heaven? Is it about even receiving an immortal body? It's not all about that. It's about restoring relationship between man and God. It's about restoring relationship between us and the Father. That's what it's all about. That's the crux of the whole story. That's the focus of everything God does. And we've got to keep that in mind. He wants relationship with you. The devil, knowing that he wants relationship with you, makes that his chief effort is to keep you out of right relationship with God. Keep you separated from God. Keep you insulated from God to where you feel God is far off. Cause you to be one of these people that when you're praying is that you're looking up to heaven. God, I hope you can hear me up there not realizing the kingdom of God is within you. God's in your heart. If you're a Christian, he's in you. You see, the reason when Jesus died on the cross, that the the veil in the temple was torn in two. It's symbolic of this. Now there is a way for even the common man, not a priest, because we are priests though in God, but even the common man, the Christian, can walk right into the presence of God doesn't need anybody to intercede for him. He can walk in himself. I want you to know this, is that when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, what happens is this. There's a tearing of the curtain, we'll say, the veil, because you have a place in you called a spirit, and you have a place in you called a soul, and your soul is that realm where you're just the natural thinking person that you are, the mind, the will, the emotions, all that normal, everyday stuff that everybody does. But your spirit is that place where God dwells, and God desires to move from 
that place where he dwells in your spirit into your soul and affect your whole life. And what he does when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, he tears the curtain, not just so you can get in, but so he can get out. So he can fill you. So he can fill you with his presence. He wants to have the whole temple full of his glory. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God desires. He wants relationship. He wants to be one with you. It says, they that are joined unto the Lord are one spirit. So how can, you know, the, the children of Israel, Joshua and Caleb, let's take those two guys, how did they prepare to get into the promised land? Because you've got to kind of ready yourself. You've got to think about what you're going to do in a minute. You're going to go into a place where there's giants. There's a place where there's fortified cities. There's huge armies who are very successful at what they do. And you're going to go in there, and you're a bunch of rookies. You're people that haven't fought many battles before. And you've got to prepare yourself somehow. And usually what's going to happen before you ever prepare yourself, fear is going to come in upon you, and you're going to say, why don't we just stay where we're at? That's what happened to all the rest of those guys, that 600,000 men that didn't enter. They stayed where they were at because of fear. But something was different about Joshua and Caleb. How were they different? Why were they different? How did they have this kind of faith to be able to go against all odds, to believe that God would help them no matter what had happened. How could they get that kind of faith? We talked about it last week. We talked about it was all about relationship. We talked about the relationship that Joshua had with God. We talked about the thing that made Joshua different than everybody else was that when Moses was up on the mountaintop, he wasn't alone. Joshua was there. And he spent 40 days in the presence of the Spirit of God. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting and God manifested to talk to him, he wasn't alone. Joshua was with him. And Joshua spent time in the tent. In fact, it even said, as we heard last week, when Moses left the tent, Joshua stayed behind because he stayed in the presence of God. Getting in the presence of God will build up your faith like nothing else. Getting in the presence of God will make you as bold as a lion. It says the righteous are as bold as a lion. See? Getting in the presence of God will cause you to have such a relationship with him that you don't worry about what's out there against you. You say, if God's for me, what is it if the whole world's against me? Right? It's all about relationship. Now, we read a scripture last week, which uh, the first part of the scripture I'm not really going to focus on, just the last part. Daniel 11.32 says, first part says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt with flatteries. But here's the part I want. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. We learned last week that where it says the people that know their God, who are those folks? The ones that are going to be strong. Who are the ones that are going to do great exploits? Who are these people that know God? We looked at that word last week, no. And that word last week, no, is a special word. It comes from the same word that's used in the book of Genesis concerning Adam and Eve when it says that Adam went into his wife Eve and knew her and she bore a child. This is a very, very intimate kind of knowing. This isn't just knowing about God. This isn't knowing of God. This isn't believing there is a God. This is knowing God personally, intimately. How do you know God intimately? You spend time in his presence. Time in his presence is what Joshua did. Spending time in his presence causes you to be one of these people that we're talking about that is strong and does great exploits. That kind of faith, that kind of confidence only comes from spending time in God's presence. Joshua was strong. He was capable of great exploits because he knew God intimately. That's the key. It's relationship. Let's look at Joshua right before they started. We're going to go in and take the promised land. Let's look what, what happened in Joshua chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1. Joshua 1, 1 is where we'll start. It says, After death, the death of Moses, the servant of God, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. Okay? Now, God has a funny way of putting things. It's not the way we would put them. God says, I'm going to give you this. But we think of a gift as something you, you just sit, you sit in your seat, and God brings it to you and drops it in your lap. However, that wasn't the case here. I'm giving you this land. Now go in and fight the battles and get it. Eh, Kind of a kind of gift I don't want right now, God. You know, I kind of want you to do this stuff for me. He says, no, no. I've made you strong. I've made you courageous. I've given you the power to do this. I am with you. What are you afraid of? Use that faith. Go in there and take the land. So anyway, it says the Lord says, I'm about to give you this land. Third verse. I will give you, give, right? 
Every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. This is the important thing God's saying. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Now, you can get a guarantee on a product, and the guarantee on the product is only as good as the company that grants the guarantee. Okay? All right? So I've gotten guarantees on stuff before where I bought something that was, like, really cheap, and it's, like, made in Beijing or something, and it's got this lifetime warranty on it. And, you know, you realize when you read it, how am I ever going to get a hold of these people? Because what I, this, this product is, is, is made to last, you know, like a very short period of time. So whose lifetime are we talking about? <laughs> is it my lifetime? Their lifetime? The, I think it's the lifetime of the product. When the product wears out, the warranty's over. Okay? So, and then you go, well, I'll just sue them. Oh, sure you will. You're going to go get an international court and sue some guy in Beijing in a shack that's making this thing. No, but they can put warranty. Warranty. You go, oh, it's warrantied for life. Yeah, you try to, you try to get that thing replaced. Okay. And then what they'll do, too, sometimes these products on TV is, is they'll say, we will replace it for free if it ever wears out. The shipping costs more than the product costs. But when God gives a warranty... I'm saying, consider the source. When God says nobody will be able to stand you all the days of your stand against you all the days of your life, when God says that, when God says you'll be able to do this, you'll be able to possess this, you'll be able to take this because I'm going to be with you every step of the way. When God says that, you can bank on it. Okay, the only way you wouldn't bank on it is if you didn't know Him well enough. You see, that's the thing that causes people to back up and to fear. They don't know him well enough. Because if you know him well enough, then you'll take him at his word. Because you realize he will never let you down. He will never forsake you, ever. That's what he said. Sixth verse, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Give. Be strong and very courageous. God keeps saying be strong and courageous. You know when God tells you to do something, he's not just trying to cheer you up. He's actually, as he says it, he's giving you the ability to actually do it. So when he says, be, when he says let there be light, light occurs. When he says be strong, you become strong if you just receive it. Be strong, be courageous, be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or, from, or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? He did several times. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. He's saying don't be afraid. This is the kind of thing Joshua was meditating on before he went into the promised land. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, wherever the... The, the sole of your foot treads. He says, I'll be with you. Then drop down to the 13th verse. Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. That's something I want to focus on for a moment. So the way you get rest is by getting this thing that he promised you. The way you get rest is by getting this land. He says, I'll just give you rest in the land. He says, I'll give you rest by giving you the land. Do you know, lots of us are striving and struggling in lots of areas of our lives because we haven't received the promises God has promised us. And it causes certain emptiness, and it causes certain defeatism within us, and it causes us to feel lack, and it causes us to feel weak. God wants to give you what you desire. It says that your joy may be full. God wants to give you rest by giving you what he's promised you. But I'm going to tell you the funny thing about God's rest. In this case, you've got to battle to get it. You realize everything God's promised you is waiting for you to take. But you realize at the same time there is a devil that resists you. You have an enemy that resists you. The children of Israel had a land that was laid before them. It was all theirs to take, there for the taking. But there was an enemy that was resisting them. There was somebody who says, we're not going down without a fight. But the Lord said, be courageous. I will be with you. Now, Fighting off people to get rest sounds kind of counterintuitive, you know? 
But then again, God's kingdom realities are often, often the opposite of the way our mind thinks. Okay? So Hebrews 4, 8 through 11 says this. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. We're the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. It didn't say he ceases from works. He ceases from his own works. You see, when you enter into God's rest, you still work, but you're working for God and you're working by his power. But this is the part I wanted to get to. 11th verse. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. It's showing us here that the people who couldn't enter into the promised land, it was because of unbelief, and they couldn't enter their rest because of unbelief. It says, don't let us fall for that. But it also says, labor to enter into the rest. Once again, here it seems counterintuitive. You've got to work to get into a rest. That's an interesting thing. We must labor to enter into a rest. What a curious thing. Remember how we saw that God said that he would give them rest by giving them the land he promised? How exactly was he going to give them that land? Was he going to convince the enemy to just all the enemies, all the enemy kingdoms that were there, all of the armies, was he going to convince them in one night just to say, let's just pack up and leave it to these Israelites? Let's just leave it. That isn't the case. Those people were in the land, and uh, the children of Israel were going to have to fight. Why? 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 You see, in the desert, they learned this. They learned to depend on God for everything. They learned they couldn't do anything without him. They're going to learn through this experience this also. No matter what comes against you, once again, put your dependency on God and you will make it. You will survive. Not only will you survive, you'll be a conqueror. But you've got to be courageous. Because if you're not courageous, you'll be these people that fall after the example of unbelief and never enter into the rest. So how do you become courageous? Courageous. How do you become brave? How do you become full of faith? The only way to do that is to spend time in God's presence. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from just psyching yourself up. I've seen people so many times, big talkers on on these uh, shows where people compete. They say, I'm going to win. I'm the best here. I'm obviously the best. And they fall, they fall, they fall. You know? It's not about your efforts. It's not about your strength. It's not about your abilities. It's about God. When you learn to depend on God for everything, then you've got it right. And then God shows up. So all the promises of God, the Bible says, are yes in Christ Jesus. And don't be surprised, though, that as you're reaching for those promises, you have some resistance because there's somebody who resists you. Because the person who resists you is the devil, and the devil knows that if you receive the promises God has for you, you will be walking in God's peace and in God's rest, and he doesn't want you to have that. The only way to go in and possess the promises is to have intimate knowledge of Jesus, to be compelled by your faith in him, to be strong in your determination, to get what he has given you and to walk in faith that is powered by God's love. So why didn't that first generation of Israel enter into the promised land? Simple word is fear. That's why they didn't, right? We learned how they went in and saw the, the... the spies went into the land, and they saw the giants in there. They saw the, the armies in there, and they said, they're too big for us. We look like grasshoppers. They look like giants. So the reason they didn't enter the promised land is fear. And fear brings about a lack of faith. And fear will paralyze you so that you can't move forward like they couldn't. And you stay where you're at. And there are some people that will die not ever receiving many of the promises that God intends for them. Right? Because they're paralyzed by fear. So what is the antidote to fear? We want to give you that. The antidote to fear. I want you to know this is something that most people won't guess. Faith is not the antidote to fear. Okay? Faith, you might say, is the opposite of fear, but it's not the antidote to fear. The antidote to fear is love. It's God's kind of love. Okay? Human love is not powerful enough, but God's love is more than enough because God's love is perfect and it lacks nothing. And contained in God's love is every element of faith you're ever going to need because it says that In God's love, it says, the man who has that kind of love believeth all things, right? Believeth all things. You have all kinds of faith. The Bible also tells us that if you have all kinds of faith and don't have love, it'll profit you nothing. The Bible also tells us that the faith, the God kind of faith that we can exercise, it tells us that it's powered, it's energized by love. Faith worketh by love. So how do you get out of fear? You've got to get into love. But it's not just any love. 
it's God's kind of love. It's the agape kind of love. And how do you get in that love? Well, you know what? His very presence is the atmosphere of that love. His very essence is that love. The Bible says God is love. You want to get rid of fear? You have to saturate yourself in the perfect love of God. Now, you can try the love of other people, and that'll help you get a little ways. The love of other people will help you. You know, your mama says, you can do it, Sonny. Go and do it. Maybe you can, but maybe you can't. But the love of God is perfect. And the love of God will get you where you need to go. Now, 1 John 4.18 says this. It tells you how to get rid of fear. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love. And there's only one kind that's perfect. It's God's kind. Perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love drives out fear. The kind of love that comes through intimacy with Jesus Christ. Intimacy occurs when we spend time in his presence. Just as Joshua did in the tent of meeting and upon the mountaintop. The devil is desperate to keep this kind of love from you. Because if this kind of love gets in you, it will cause you to be powerful. It will cause you to do mighty exploits and to be strong in the Lord. And the devil doesn't want that. It gives you the ability to do that that normal people cannot do because God's love is filled with God's power. The devil wants to keep you in fear because if you get faith, you'll become dangerous to his kingdom. Perfect love casts out all fear, and that fills you with faith. So how can we ever gain this perfect love for ourselves? Well, we can't manufacture it because we don't have it. We can't get it from a human being because they don't have it. The only place you get perfect love, it comes from God. If you'll receive perfect love, then fear will leave you and you can walk in that love and in the power of that love. Stop trying to perfect your love because you're never going to perfect your love. You know? You got to throw your love out and accept the Holy Spirit. He had God's love. He had the healing power. He had all that. That's what he had to give that man. He didn't give him something of his own possession, something that he created himself. It wasn't his own uh, efforts that caused this man to walk because he said later on, it's faith in Jesus Christ that has made this man whole. Right? It's Jesus Christ who did it. But where did he get that thing that he imparted to this man? It's because he himself had been filled up with the Holy Spirit, with God's love, and he had something to give. He said, such as I have, give I unto you. If you're walking around half full, you don't have much to give away. We have to be continually allowing the Holy Spirit to pour into us. We have to keep the faucet open. Oh, my goodness, last night brings up something. So, so Viona, Viona uh, was... Uh, they, they were in this uh, adults prayer, adults um, awaken group, and, and they were all praying and getting little pictures and writing them down. And Viona got a picture of water, water. I wonder what that means, water. I wonder what water means. I wonder what that means. So they go downstairs, and the whole place is flooded, you know. And, and the, the drinking fountain had sprung a leak, and it's leaking all over the floor, so they call me, you know, you know, 11 o'clock or so. And I rush over here, and thank God that they were here that late at night. Thank God they caught it, because otherwise I'd come this morning, we'd be under four feet of water. So the Lord caught it because the devil wanted to cause us a problem. But it didn't cause us a problem. Actually, it taught us to have some real teamwork. We all got together, and we got that place cleaned out, you know? The devil's always going to try to mess with us. But the thing is, is if we had let that water flow, that place would have filled up. All right? Don't turn off the spigot. Let God's love continually to flow in your heart and fill you overflowingly. You find out when you overflow with God's kind of love, you have to give it away. You can't keep it within you. You'll find that as you touch people and you begin to pray for healing, that love just flows and you can't help yourself. You find when you talk, your speech is seasoned with grace. And you begin to speak God's word and it flows from you because you're so full of God's love. You know, some people say you're full of it. Well, you want to be full of this. You want to be full of God's love. So full of God's love, that agape love, that perfect love that you have something to give. And you become a vessel of honor. You become the person God made you to be. And you become the person that says, I do know my God. And because of that, I can be strong and do great exploits. And you're the person that goes out there and you get what God has promised you. Because you take it by force. Because that kind of love chases the devil away. That kind of love is more powerful than anything the devil has in his arsenal. That kind of love empowers you to do great exploits. So today, what do you need? Everybody, every one of us needs more of that kind of love. The devil has tried to fool us for years. You can't walk in that kind of love. You just gotta gotta go to the drinking fountain now and then and get a sip of it. It's not the way it works. God has put within you a fountain of living water. 
An everlasting flow comes from that fountain. It doesn't ever have to stop every day of your life. It can be bubbling over and over and over. It's like an artesian well. You don't have to pump it. A lot of people go to prayer and they try to install a pump in prayer and go, oh, I'm trying to get the Lord up from the bottom here. I'm trying to get, trying to get in the mood, trying to get the Spirit of God pumping here. You know what? If you have this artesian well of God in you, it bubbles up. It flows. You just have to take the stopper off it and let God fill you. Now, there's so many things we would like to do. There's so many promises we would like to achieve and, and things we would like to gain in the Spirit and we'd like to accomplish for God. And so many of these things we try to do with our own fuel, and your own fuel can't take you there. The thing that takes you there is God's love. And so then we go, well, then I know I need God's love, so I'm going to go and beg for some. It's a misunderstanding the devil wants you to have. The devil wants you to have this idea that when you get good enough, God will give you his love. He'll pour it out on you. When you stop doing all kinds of stuff you're not supposed to be doing, God's love will pour out on you. I want you to know that God's love is the very thing you need first. He loved you first before you loved him. He loved you. He even sent his son to die as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world before you loved him. He extended his his hand of grace to you before you loved him. It says we love him because he first loved us. That's what the Bible says. And you want to do great things in God, you have to just open yourself up and say, Lord, I receive your love. I receive the free gift of your love. You may say, I got to clean myself up first. Oh, you got it backwards. That love will clean you up. Because when you love God, it says you keep his commandments, right? And you go, I'm trying to manufacture some love for you, Lord. He goes, I don't want the stuff you're manufacturing. Just take what I've got. Let me fill you with my love. You say, but Lord, I'm not worthy. He says, well, you never were worthy. Don't worry about that. That's not the problem. Just open the door of your heart and let me fill you. But Lord, I'm, I'm not right with you right now. I'm not this. I'm not that. Lord, I'm going to have to pray more and read. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. All those things you're trying to do, you're trying to do with no fuel. Come and get fueled up first. Let me pour my love into you. If I pour my love into you and you just open the floodgates, uh, you know, and let it flood in, you just let it flood in, he says, I will be for you this fountain of water that springs into eternal life, and you can build a river of living water within us. And when you get that river flowing through you, you know what? You will just begin to do the right thing. It will cleanse you. It will take away those desires you have that you shouldn't have. It'll motivate you to do what you should be doing. It'll straighten all the mess out if you just let the love in. That's the secret to it all. Now, is it hard to get? Are the heavens as brass as you pray? And I'm trying to get closer to the Lord. I'm trying to talk. You know what? Forget about going to the Lord in the Old Testament like we're going to offer up a bullock or a ram and we're going to light the fire and hope that God, the smoke ascends and maybe God will accept it. It isn't that way anymore. The sacrifice is over. He says, come, come before me with boldness. Come before me with boldness to my throne of grace, right? And just take what I've got for you. We need to say, you know what? There should be no obstacle between me and God. Only obstacles that there are, they're in my head. So time now to say, right now, I cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and I bring it into captivity, every single thought. And I say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. He loves me, and he wants to pour his love into me. And I'm open to it, Lord. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up, Lord. All right. Now, before we continue on and dismiss, I want to find out here is if there's anybody here today who has not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not... If you have not, you do not have eternal life. You do not have the promise of heaven. You are not free from sin. But the, that's the bad news. The good news is there's an antidote to all that. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a solution to all that. It's very simple. You just accept God's love. Accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Let him become the Lord of your life. Let him save you. If there's anybody here that has not accepted Jesus Christ, you can do that right now today. Doesn't cost a thing. Doesn't cost a thing. You know, do you charge the garbage man? Do you charge him for taking your garbage away? You actually pay him to take away, don't you? We're worried about all stuff we got to get give up so that God will, you know, so that God can come into our heart. Don't you realize he's hauling the garbage away? He wants to fill you with the good stuff. Anybody here? All right. Then just bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, right now, we now, Lord, we take off, we take the stompers out, Lord. 
We take the blockages out in Jesus' name. We say, Satan, we just bring your kingdom down in Jesus' name. Get the obstacles out of our way in Jesus' name. Take your obstacles and go back where you came from. We open ourselves, Lord. We open the doors of our heart to you, Jesus. We say, Lord, flow into us. Fill us with your love overflowingly. And, Lord, we're not going to make this a thing that we uh, uh, come and do once a day. We're going to walk in this. We're going to say, Lord, the doors of our heart are open to you always. The gates shall never be closed day or night, Lord. But we will let you flow, Lord, your love into us. And as you flow your love into us, Lord, we'll become strong. We'll become courageous. We will do mighty exploits in your name, Lord. We will reach out to the lost, Lord. We will pray for the sick and they will be healed, Lord. We'll do all the things you've asked us because, Lord, we are fueled by the power of your love. And we receive it right now in Jesus' name. Just receive it all right now in Jesus' name. Let him fill you up right now. And thank him for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Each and every morning when you wake up, say, Lord, just fill me again. Just fill me, fill me, fill me. Fill me in Jesus' name. Fill me, Lord. I can't go through this day without being filled first. It's my first meal is I got to be filled with you, Lord. When you're filled with his presence, you will walk in the spirit. You will do the things God has designed for you to do. And you will achieve the goals he has set for you. We receive you fully, Lord, into our hearts. Have free reign in our hearts, Father. Because... The kingdoms of our heart are now your kingdom, Lord. And we thank you for your wonderful love. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Don't miss Wednesday night. You will certainly get something out of it. God bless you. We will see you next time.